Hey everyone, welcome back to the Barbell Medicine YouTube channel or podcast, wherever you're getting your news from. This is episode 24, programming part three. I'm joined, as always, with the second most handsome doctor I know, <laughs> Dr. Baraki. What's going on, man? Hey, man. Uh, as I was just telling you, just uh, post-call, worked overnight last night, and ready to get this programming discussion wrapped up. Wrapped up. All right, in a little bow. So, coming to you. From Barbell Medicine Headquarters in Santa Cruz, California, this is Programming Part 3. You're listening to the Barbell Medicine Programming Podcast, Part 3, with your hosts, Dr. Austin Baraki and Dr. Jordan Feigenbaum. All right, so we thought it'd be a good idea to kind of summarize what we've covered so far in Parts 1 and Part 2. If you haven't checked those out, make sure uh, you listen to those before you consume this one. It's going to make things a lot more clear. Uh, so, Austin, let's get some definitions out of the way. I, why don't you kind of cover the... Yeah, stress recovery, adaptation, and kind of how they apply to what we've t talked about so far. Yeah, so in our first episode, we kind of described stress as basically that which reduces your performance. And stresses or stressors come in a variety of different forms, and they can fall along a spectrum of being more productive, uh, which is going to be defined as the extent to which they uh, improve your adaptation towards a specific goal, to non-productive stressors that are, you know, they can be very, very stressful to you as an organism, uh, either physiologically, psychologically, or both, but do not generate uh, much of an adaptation to speak of towards the desired goal. Uh, recovery, in contrast to the stressor that has reduced our performance, recovery is that which uh, the process by which your performance returns to baseline. And we also emphasize the ideas that recovery capacity, uh, similarly kind of analogous with the idea of work capacity, uh, improves with training. So your ability to recover from training improves with training. This is uh, supported by mountains and mountains of, of data, as well as everybody's experience in the sense that as they get more trained, they can train more, recover faster, and tolerate it better. Right. That's... I think one thing that's important to point out because we 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 reference this repeated bout effect or RBE all the time, and, and I think it's fair to say that within the literature, it's been classically described as reduced muscular damage from a given bout or episode of training that you're exposed to multiple times. However, however, there's also some data that's that's starting to accrue that's suggesting that people will respond less significantly to that same bout of training. Um, well, and, and so while that's not classically the repeated bout effect, it appears to be, you know, the, yeah, yeah. So, so I, I you know, I, I don't want to mince words and I, I don't want people to say, oh, well, that's a repeated bout effect. And, and, you know, because classically that's not the definition. However, I don't have a better definition for, <laughs> for that phenomena at the time. And, and certainly there's evidence um, that, that is, again, mounting uh, to, to support that. Do you have any, any words on that? Yeah, I mean, I think we're referring to, you know, some of the evidence related to attenuation and anabolic signaling in trained individuals compared to untrained individuals, meaning that they are relatively desensitized. In other words, they do not respond as robustly. Uh, when they are the more trained they become. And so the combination of the true classical repeated bout effect by which uh, you it's a protective effect against muscle damage and the fact that you're relatively desensitized against it means that the more trained you get, the easier it becomes to tolerate these physiologic stressors, which is important as it pertains to training and our management of, of, of training. Yeah, I think people need to uh, kind of really, really chew on that for a minute just to, to get to grasp that firmly. And further... You know, some people might suggest that, well, due to this repeated bout effect, due to this sort of uh, decreased signaling that you get secondary to repeated training of the same style, uh, that's not always a bad thing. Um, sometimes you were, used, were uh, leveraging that to our advantage. So, for instance, from a muscular hypertrophy standpoint, if you just constantly blast somebody with training that makes them sore all the time and and really, you know, beats them up, they're not actually going to get a higher hypertrophy response. In fact, there's evidence that's mounting that you don't get this, this uh, good hypertrophy response until you can tolerate said training. Right. Because you're, you're spending so much resources trying to repair the damage rather than take care of you know, what needs to be done. Right. And, and there's a difference amongst individuals as far as how quickly that occurs and, and how much they can tolerate right off the bat. And that, again, goes back to the sort of inter-individual difference in response to a given training stress. So I just chew on it, chew on the repeated bout effect, chew on how that may affect, you know, things, things downstream. And, and we're certainly going to talk about that more, but I, I want to be crystal clear with how we're using that term 
um, in in this discussion. So, uh, so we talked about the, the the stress, the recovery, and then the adaptation generated. Of course, everybody should be familiar by now with the specificity of the adaptation uh, to the to the imposed stressor. But also, the other things we emphasized include the ideas that the degree of adaptation that you get in response to a given stressor is going to depend significantly on where you fall along this spectrum of training sensitivity that we've laid out and emphasized the the importance of. Where the more sensitive you are to training related to a bunch of variables that we talked about in the last podcast, the more robust response you present to a given training stimulus and the more training resistant or the less training sensitive you are, the less robust of a physiologic uh, or an adaptive response you present to a given training stimulus. So not only does this degree of training sensitivity vary between people, again, a component of this inter-individual variation, the sensitivity uh, to training also varies within an individual over time. And this is kind of what we were just talking about in terms of uh, related to the repeated bout effect and the other effects of repeated bouts when you get things like your uh, attenuation of, of anabolic signaling and desensitization to stimuli. So in other words, the more trained you get, the less sensitive you become to to those uh, to those uh, training stimuli over time, which can have some, some either logical, theoretical, or practical consequences in terms of how you manage someone's training. So those are kind of the summaries of part one, the stress recovery and adaptation formula. I think you had some additional uh, definitions you wanted to lay out just to be super clear for people up front. Yeah. I mean, we talk about programming variables all the time. And, and I think, you know, we, we haven't necessarily covered them in a concise, definitive uh, manner. And I, I think it's, we're just assuming that people are up on this stuff and maybe that's incorrect. So just as an aside, you know, if you're if you're really into programming, then perhaps you already know this stuff. You can take a little nap. But uh, if you're if uh, maybe some of this stuff is new to you, then uh, I want to be crystal clear on our definitions. So when we discuss volume, okay, we are only discussing reps time sets. So if you do three sets of ten, the volume is thirty. If you do five sets of six, the volume is thirty. If you do three sets of five, the volume is fifteen. Okay, so that is volume. Tonnage is volume times the intensity, meaning there's a weight associated with the volume. So three sets of five at 100 pounds, it, the tonnage is 1,500. Um, I will make an aside and say that tonnage in and of itself isn't a terribly useful metric. Rather, what you would want to know is the volume and the average intensity. Okay, Average intensity is uh, a, a term that refers to the percent of one rep max, the loading on the bar. So average intensity would be you know, what the, the weight of the sets that you're doing and how that uh, relates to your 1RM. So average intensity may be the same for sets across, right? If you're doing the same weight uh, across sets, or it may be a, an average of all of the intensities that you're using if you're doing an ascending or descending um, or, or multiple sets at different weights. So there's a, that's relative intensity uh, uh, and average intensity would be the average of those absolute intensity would be just what is the weight on the bar. Um, and you know, let's say you have two different people. Person one can squat 600 pounds. Person two can squat 100 pounds. All right. There is an absolute difference in the amount of weight that they can handle. However, 70% of that is, is equivalent for each person. Now the outcome you know, or outcomes that you, you get from training at 70% may be different for those populations, but it's not due to the actual weight on the bar, the absolute intensity. It's due to the inter-individual response to that training, which, you know, there's a difference amongst the population as far as how you respond to the stress, but it has nothing to do with the absolute load, all right? That has more to do with the person that we're discussing and their individual differences in how they respond to training. So principally, we're talking about volume, intensity, uh, and, and when we discuss tonnage, that's in the context of a relative intensity, not necessarily an absolute intensity. And tonnage in and of itself, I find, is a not terribly useful sort of metric to, to track. It's more of a, it's indirectly modified by either adding reps or subtracting reps or sets, uh, or adding relative intensity to the equation. Whereas just the tonnage, people will say, will brag and say, oh, I did 30,000 pounds this week of tonnage. And we're like, I mean, you could have done that with the empty barbell. I mean, re really, if you did enough reps and sets. And so that's not terribly meaningful from a programming management standpoint. And, and again, I just want to be crystal clear so that when we talk about volume and tonnage and relative intensity, that you guys are also aware of, uh, of what we're talking about. So we've laid out some of the basic uh, training variables. We've refreshed everyone's memory on our definitions that we use of stress and recovery and adaptation and the nuances thereof. 
And uh, so, so the, a few other points before we get into the meat of this podcast is that we've already discussed multiple times the importance of the massive amount of inter-individual variability in training responsiveness. And there are some consequences to this that everyone should be aware of. And, and the, the most important of them is that any program can work if you apply it to the right trainee who has the appropriate level of training sensitivity to which to, uh, and they're going to respond to that program. Conversely, any program can also fail if you apply it to the wrong trainee. Any program can. And so when you hold up a specific program and say, this one worked for me, this one didn't work for me, it's like, okay, well, this is in the context of just you, and it is not terribly generalizable just based on that fact alone. We can still analyze it based on, you know, programming variables and how that, you know, c compares to what we what we generally understand about, uh, you know, training humans on a population level from the available evidence and things like that to make a conclusion as to whether this is a quote unquote good or not as good program for somebody. Um, but I think we see this a lot where they're like, yeah, well, you know, I, 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 uh, I deadlifted once a month and I put a bunch of weight on my deadlift and it's like, cool that, you know, you are somebody who is sufficiently sensitive to the stress that you were delivering, that you were able to make progress on that. And that is not really generalizable to essentially anybody else. So what we're trying to do here when we lay all this stuff out is we're trying to create a model to explain what we see and predict what we see in a generalizable fashion across the population that can help to explain why does one person respond to one thing and not to another, or why do two different people respond in different ways to a given program and things like that. Right. And I think that's kind of the elegant thing that we're doing. We're, we're making uh, sort of general guidelines by which we would expect things to work and mechanisms by which those things do work. And then when you see this difference in response, you can't just say, uh, that's an outlier. You say, well, that person has, you know, this amount of training sensitivity and this amount of previous training and, and blah, blah, blah. So we would actually, that seems reasonable. You know, it just gives you a, re a way to interpret different responses to the same, the same stimulus. And, and that way you're not trying to make all these sort of, uh, you know, one-off, uh, like, uh, that doesn't make any sense. We have to reject that or, you know, because the experience that people have is just different. I mean, that's, that's it. The, the, when I make, when I made the article, wrote the article about five, three, one, not being a terribly useful training program as written, you know, people come out of the woodwork and say, no, man, five, three, one worked great for me. And it's like, all right, well, well, why? I'm not saying that it didn't. I'm just saying that there are reasons why it worked for you in this context and they need to fit this model, which is, which is what we're, what we're kind of laying out here. Yeah. Yeah. I think that, uh, in, you know, it's, it's, um, I don't know, it's, it's appealing to try to uh, really simplify things down and try to use some sort of like logical analysis to, to deduce how everything is going to work from a physiologic and training adaptation standpoint, but it is just woefully inadequate tool to be able to predict, to, to, to be able to predict the function or how, you know, these complex biological systems work. The problem is, is that even at this stage in time with our current level of understanding, we still don't know what we don't know that could end up being a confounding variable. And so an example, you know, I think both of us can think of numerous examples throughout, you know, in, in medicine in particular, where this, where this applies, where, you know, we had some idea or understanding of something or some knowledge that was passed down from one generation to the next based on logic um, that, that sounded plausible or that made perfect sense to us at the time. And then something new, some new piece of information or something we didn't know comes out that just overturns everything. And so the example that I, that I commonly cite on this is, you know, historically in the setting of patients who have heart failure, which for those who are not, uh, you know, medically trained in the audience results when the heart is unable to efficiently perform its function and deliver sufficient blood to the body. Um, and in that situation, the giving patients beta blockers, which is a type of medication that can slow down the heart, the rate of the heart and sometimes reduce how hard it is squeezing was thought to be absolutely contraindicated. You should absolutely never give beta blockers to patients with heart failure because if it's not pumping well enough and you give it something that can make it pump worse, plain logic would say that that's a terrible idea. And then we didn't know about the whole complex hormone, neurohormonal cascade that can happen in the body that can modify how your heart functions. And it turns out that beta blockers are super effective at modifying that response. And so now it is standard of care for patients with heart failure to be put on beta blockers because it improves their, their mortality. This is something that logic would have predicted should absolutely never be used in these patients. And now because there's something that we didn't know, we realized, hey, this is a little bit more complex than we thought and we're using it. So 
Yes, and logic is just it's just inadequate tool to figure out how to train complex biological organisms. So we, we, you know the things that we can use are a combination of our observations and our experience in coaching people, which I think everybody would agree upon. But everybody has to be aware that every single person is going to be a victim of their own confirmation bias. We're all going to see what we want to see, and we're going to be tempted to discard what we don't like in terms of our observations. I mean, that's a that's a human thing. You're you're trying to make sense of of things, and and the only thing you have to use for that is your previous experience and education. So if whatever you've been exposed to, whatever you've learned over the course of your entire life, that's what you get to use to expand explain phenomena and make things nice and neat in your brain. Otherwise, you have this sort of uh, unease. Or, yeah, you're like uh, I don't know, I don't know, and it makes you feel comfortable. So you're trying to figure out a way to make yourself feel less uncomfortable, and so that we're gonna have confirmation bias, and then you know, we're basically trying to take, here's the evidence, here's been our experience, put them together. And that's just evidence-based behavioral practice. I mean, that's the best we can do and recognize the shortcomings of our own bias, our own sort of, you know, previous experience and how that makes us interpret different things. So we are not free from that. You are not free from that. No one is free from this. We're just, we're, we're trying to do the best we can. And I, I think, that makes people feel uncomfortable at times because it, it feels like you're just constantly challenging stuff all the time and there is no black and white, you know, but um, as a co- as a complex biological system, that's just kind of how it is, you know. You know, it's funny when you're talking about heart failure, I was thinking, I was like, yeah, you know, imagine the people who were doing the, the nice sugar trial who were like, oh, yeah, as it turns out, like t- more tightly controlling people's blood glucose in the hospital makes them do worse. Or, or even when you find... Yeah, or you find out like the A1C levels, like tight control of that doesn't make people live longer, have less morbidity in general in certain populations. Exactly. Giving giving antiarrhythmics to patients with structural heart disease, trying to prevent their anti their arrhythmias, they end up dying more, like all these things that logically should be like, yeah, you seem more like less likely to die and then people die more, you know, because it's complex. And even within that, I mean, there's things go back and forth. A tight control of blood pressure, for instance, was thought to, well, you're causing more problems than you're solving initially. And now, and then new data comes out that shows actually, well, if you use more, more drugs or more, whatever interventions to keep this t- more tightly controlled, you have better outcomes. And, and so people are just, they want to fight this stuff. Yeah. Everyone's heads are kind of spinning. Yeah. Yep. So it's important to constantly reevaluate and, and re, re sort of think some things uh, when presented new evidence. And that's uh, how we got here. So I think, you know, one of the main contentions that we've been laying out over the two previous podcasts have been uh, that we have some differences in how we would approach training the novice. Okay, but so I think before we wrap this part one up of this particular podcast, let's talk about how we how we train novices. Now, Austin, how many how long have you been coaching people uh, professionally? Uh, Well, I guess I've been coaching movement in some fashion. So including, including the non-strength based coaching for, I don't know, probably 10 or 15 years and then barbell coaching for probably half that. Yeah. So I've been coaching, I've been coaching barbell stuff for about 10 years now. And I mean, a lot of that's full time with a wide variety of clients. And I mean, I would hate to even guess the number of patient or sorry, client contact hours that I've had, but it's, uh, uh, more than a few. Every time that I come across a new client who wants to start training, I do an interview. And in this interview, I go through their you know, past training history, their past nutrition history, their past medical history, their current thoughts and beliefs on training. You know, you're just trying to get a better sense of who they are you know, from, a, from both a physiological and psychological sense. And regardless of all of that, there is still a high level of caution that I take when initially coaching them because just, you know, you know that their reports are biased and potentially incomplete and you'd rather err on this sort of cautious side than just, oh, well, they said, you know, they did all this and then, and then you, you do stuff that's inappropriate, uh, for them. So to me, you know, when we're discussing like the differences in programming for a novice, you know, younger person versus older person, there's actually real no difference for me in my initial approach, uh, because both are, are cautious with the, the, the difference sort of manifests itself within the first session or within the sort of uh, 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 ma- uh, management after the first session. So, cause you find out more about this person while you're actually coaching them. You get to see them move, you get to see, you know, what their work capacity is. There's a huge difference in somebody that's been training for a long time and uh, somebody who's not, 
the person who's not is sweating bullets or is out of breath or is really, you can tell that just the warmups, you know, that what we, you thought were going to be warmups are actually very taxing on them. And so you have to adjust on the fly. Um, for older people, you know, there's probably a greater proportion of folks who are of advanced age that are more deconditioned than a younger person. So you probably see that more likely, but you still see that in, you know, 30 somethings and late twenties people who were previously sedentary. So, that being said, the overall goal of the first session and the initial management is to get people to complete the workout that you had in mind. And, you know, if we're doing the novice linear progression, that's three sets of five on a squat, three sets of five on the bench press or press, and then one set of five on the deadlift. Going into that session, I have, uh, you know, no preconceived sort of, uh, hey, I'm going to limit this training volume for this this client. I, I know that I want them to do that three sets of five. I, I just... You have to watch and see how they do and adjust on the fly. So I would not go into a training session and say, well, this older person is just going to do one heavy set of five and that's it. That's not, that's not what I would do. And in fact, based on current evidence and, and my experience, I would have them do three sets of five. Okay. Maybe not sets across. Maybe some of those are back off sets, or maybe I'm including some of those warm up sets in their total training volume for the day. But I do know that limiting them to just one, set of five above 60% is probably not enough unless they are very, very deconditioned, in which case I find that out as we're, as we're going up. So I think that's probably one big, you know, kind of point of, of difference, uh, when training an older person, uh, or somebody who's very deconditioned because we wouldn't just say, ah, one set of five is that's enough. We we're trying to develop them longer term and set them up for future success and, not addressing the deficiency right off the bat is is an issue. Uh, similarly, if I had a novice person that had a 40 inch waist, okay, I know that I'm going to probably program conditioning for them right off the bat. That's probably something I'm going to do because I know that's a risk factor for developing secondary disease processes due to obesity or abdominal obesity in, in, in particular. Um, but again, these are things that I, I'm gleaning from that sort of background information. Um, and I think the, uh, the final sort of big disagreement or big sort of line in the sand that we draw is at the end of the novice progression. Uh, at the end of the novice progression, it doesn't really matter the weights that you end at, uh, you know, what you're working with for, for your squats or your deadlifts. It matters. Can you respond to the given amount of stress with an adaptive response that allows you to add weight to the bar while keeping the relative effort the same? Because if that's not happening, all right, then you're showing that the training stress is not appropriate for the adaptation that you're trying to, you're demanding for the next session. And so instead of like running that out, you know, taking, taking sets out, taking reps out, just so you can add weight to the bar, which is rather arbitrary. We're using weight on the bar as a, just a stressor to get a general physical adaptation. Uh, if you can't do that, then our management is, well, let's just change the training. Let's change stress. Let's change the programming. We're not married to this program. Let's change things. So that way, and, and if within those changes, we predict to get an improvement in the outcomes we're looking for, which would be strength demonstration, hypertrophy, muscle cross-sectional area, improve work capacity and tolerance of training, all, you know, all sorts of things. Um, but the weight on the bar for a submaximal set of five is, I mean, it's just a tool. It's kind of irrelevant, really, if you, if you think about it. I mean, we could get into an existential discussion that we're all just moving arbitrarily sized weights through space. <laughs> that was what I wrote in my uh, in my caption the other day. It's like when you zoom out, that's what we're doing. But I think I think it's really just interesting to observe the fact that you know there's no other like kind of sporting context or a situation where you like introduce a kid to athletics or or any sort of athlete to a new physical task. And you are so obsessed about optimizing the first like month or two months or whatever of their training. Uh, it's, it's just, you know, so, so I think it's important that we send people through a novice program for sure. Cause it's, you know, it's very useful for a number of reasons that we'll, that we'll talk about, but the absolute weight on the bar at the end of any given person's novice progression has relatively little significance, I think, when it comes to zooming out and looking at long-term outcomes. I mean, I, I cite myself as an example on this all the time, like my results from, Novice training and early intermediate training on the novice program and the three standard three day Texas method were completely unremarkable. Uh, I would say they were average on the on the novice program when I squatted two eighty five and probably sub sub 
you know, normal or, or poor on the, on the Texas method, squatting 370 for a single. So, and that has had no significant bearing on my long-term development since then, where I ended up, whether it was 265, 285, 305, or 350, 360, 370, or 405 on, on the next stage of training. So, uh, I think, I think that's why we're trying to zoom out and look more at a long-term perspective on this stuff. Yeah. I mean, if you ask any coach who is involved in athletics, say, Hey, should you specialize early on in a person's career? You know, the unanimous answer by people who are in the know is, uh, no, don't do that because worse things happen, you know, long-term. And so that's kind of this, uh, a, a parallel argument to what we're suggesting here. It really doesn't matter where you end your LP, the benefits of the LP. Uh, we think there's some benefit to it in that it's very well defined, very well described. There's a ton of resources available. It, you get constant exposure to new exercises that give you, you know, that build, start building your technique very, very early on. We think that's useful. Okay. And then, um, and then the loading, uh, parameters are very, very straightforward again which which helps uh people uh sort of adhere and build positive habits and training and showing up to the gym and things like that are all good yeah exactly exactly and i, I don't think that outside of somebody who's completely untrained before that i don't think that you need to use those as potential positive like potential sort of considerations for your programming unless evidence to the contrary exists and what i mean by that is keeping things simple all right is not necessarily an ideal sort of uh, 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 decision making. Like that shouldn't be like the the linchpin in your decision making to keep it simple, unless you have to in order to boost compliance, right? So I don't need to keep the loading parameters simple. I don't need to keep the rep scheme parameter simple. I don't need to keep the at training variation uh, simple just because simple is better. Because simple is not necessarily better, unless I have empirical evidence on that particular person that it does make a difference in their outcome. Uh, so if somebody is like, hey, man, these loading schemes, they really kind of throw me for a loop and I really can't, you know, they're getting worse outcomes because they're either missing training sessions or not doing it, you know, appropriately. We think that keeping things simple would actually make it better. Well, then we'll, we'll change stuff on the fly. But that's uh, the, the real good analogy is kind of like di diets, you know, like intermittent fasting isn't better than a norm, you know, eating, eating every, you know, three to five hours, for instance, or going low carb isn't necessarily better than high carb. That's not necessarily the case, but if it helps somebody comply and overall do better, then we'll do it, right? It's not the first line management, but we'll certainly change if presented evidence that it works significantly better for a person, but it's not the general pre prevailing sort of uh, uh, thinking that we're, we're trying to program. So I think that's a good place to cut part one. Stay tuned for part two. All right. Thanks again for checking out the Barbell Medicine podcast. We couldn't do this without you guys. We do have seminars coming up this year. First off in July, we'll be in Brooklyn, New York for a full Barbell Medicine seminar. We'll also be in Seattle, Washington in September. For those of you who are just looking to improve your lifts or want some one-on-one -on -one coaching, check us out. We'll be in Santa Cruz for a one-day training camp. We're going to cover the squat bench press, the deadlift, and the press, along with the Q&A afterwards. Uh, my favorite part of the seminar was uh, how concise and simply the information was laid out. I really enjoyed the lifting instruction, particularly Alan Thrall, who gave very good, concise cues that really helped me out. A lot of the cueing I received uh, at the seminar helped me you know, clear up a lot of things that I was wondering about. Uh, understanding how like resistance training and how using a barbell and getting strong helps like health outcomes to me is, is really fascinating actually. The favorite part of the seminar was probably the pain, pain uh, lecture. Uh, growing my knowledge bank as a strength and conditioning coach when you think you know things and you come to this you're going to find out that maybe you don't and that you're going to learn a lot more and help as many people as possible so thanks guys. Well I learned a ton. Uh, definitely the pain stuff wasn't something I was expecting like just how much I didn't know about that. Hey, my favorite part of the seminar was interacting with all the individual coaches. They all have their own particular style, their own particular way of teaching, and getting to rotate through the coaches gives you a really good, I guess, perspective and look at ways to improve each of the lifts. So head over to the barbellmedicine.com website and register today. Uh, welcome back to the Barbell Medicine Podcast Part 3. Thanks for joining us. All right, so we did a nice summary. We talked about novice training and, and kind of the differences that we're we're recommending. So now we're gonna talk about what happens after the novice progression. Uh, and I think probably one of the bigger themes that we're discussing is long-term training development. And that's kind of our big rationale for not running it out, not peaking, not doing this, what has been dubbed a sort of transitional period to Texas method or, or, or similar programming from 
the end of the novice LP. Austin, do you want to you want to talk about this long term development? I mean, like, what is it, what is it even good for? So <clears throat> there are basically. I think the, I think the place where I start and zoom out is I look at like kind of what are the modifiable or what are the factors the the determinants of force production in a given individual. That's I think the good starting point to look at. It's like what are the things that go into somebody being able to produce force. Um, of course, everyone has their uh, genetic endowment, whatever epigenetic endowment they inherited, which may change over the course of their lives. But you can't really do much about the stuff that you inherited from your parents. For example, you have your yeah, if you're and, until we can really do some solid genetic engineering on folks. Well, I've been I just bought a bunch of CRISPR technology, so yeah, I'm just gonna go replace ACN T one and three, and I'm about to I'm going to the Olympics, man. It's probably about as simple as uh, replacing the wheels on your skateboard, right? <laughs> I think it's the same. I mean, humans are effectively just machines. Just... <laughs> so, so the inheritance is stuff that has huge impact. Everybody knows genetics has a big role in in you know strength outcomes, force production, athletic ability, stuff like that. But we can't do anything about it, unfortunately, right now. Uh, the other thing is your kind of your anthropometry, your structure, your build. Uh, you know, people talk about their muscle insertions and their attachments and stuff like that having significant roles. Also, unless you're willing to go somewhat fairly uh, morbid surgery, uh, also not something that we really have the ability to easily modify in training. Um, next one would be something like your uh, muscle cross-sectional area, the total amount of muscle that you have on your on your body. And so we talk about muscular hypertrophy as as somebody becomes more experienced in training, because the fourth one would be their kind of their skill, their neuromuscular uh, efficiency, their ability to recruit their their uh, motor units efficiently, things like that, that can improve and they improve the most in the early stage of a program. But as you get past that into the post novice phase, there is some continued improvement. But the longer you go, the more trained you become. We have very uh, you know abundant amounts of evidence now showing that. Uh, muscular hypertrophy, the total amount of muscle mass, lean body mass, fat-free mass, whatever metric you want to use, uh, has more and more significance over time in people's ability to produce force and perform strength feats. Am, am I hearing you right when you say there's four things that can improve, you know, force production? One's genetics, two is anthropometry, three is hypertrophy, four is neuromuscular changes. And, and you're suggesting that, you know, outside of the unknown epigenetic changes that we can make <laughs> to the first thing, uh, that muscle size and then the neuromuscular, uh, uh, uh improvements are the main ways why we get improved force production period. A and then further that you're saying that at the beginning of training, the neuromuscular adaptations are much higher than they are later on. And then that hypertrophy is also happening when you first start training, but then becomes more and more important, the more, the longer you train. Yeah, I think when they've looked at novice trainees and their difference in strength performance, the correlations between their amount of skeletal muscle mass are not as strong. When you look at trained people, uh, particularly like, you know, like competitive lifters, I mean, we've seen correlation coefficients of, you know, R for people who are in, into that, uh, in the statistical stuff as high as 0 0.8, 0 0.9. Data showing related to the amount of muscle, skeletal muscle mass uh, that you carry per unit of height. I mean, I think people, we talk about that all the time when people are like, how much should I weigh? And we ask, how tall are you? That's basically what we're figuring out for them in our heads is, how much how much lean body mass do we think they ought to carry per per unit of height? Uh, you know the fat free mass index kind of thing. All of those things have shown to be predict strongly predictive in trained individuals of strength performance. Yeah, I mean anecdotally, when you look at strength sports and you see like who are the highest level performers in general, in general, you'll see those who are carrying the most lean body mass be the uh, highest performers within each weight class and. And, you know, so the question is, or the, you know, the pushback we get when we tell people to gain weight or, or whatever is that, yeah, well, so-and-so only weighs this much and he or she is strong AF. And it's like, well, the reason why they're the top performer in that weight class is because they do have so much lean body mass. I mean, that's that's how they got there. And they probably also have favorable, you know, factors in terms of the things that uh, are not modifiable. They probably have better genetics than you. Maybe their insertions, their anthropometry is more favorable for the task at hand compared to what you have. You know, there's always going to be somebody who is stronger than you, who is also smaller than you. And so that's why we talk about like comparing these things across individuals is le is is, is uh, kind of less useful when you talk about, you know, hey, but that person's you know, not as jacked as I am, but they're stronger. It's like, well, yeah, but that doesn't mean that you shouldn't get more jacked to make yourself stronger.
You know, this reminds me, do you remember the weightlifter? He's in the 77 kilo class or was he won the Olympics in 2000 and uh, 2004, I believe Tanner Seguir. And then it was funny. So, so, so iron mind, iron mind is hilarious. Russ, Randy, uh, the Strassen, it goes there and he, he says, he calls him the muscleless wonder. Yeah. yeah no, it's, <laughs> it's like, how do I interpret that? Is that a compliment? Is it a massive insult? Well, so yeah, but you know, so people are like, you might point to him and you say, so you don't need to be big and jacked to be the best. And it's like, well, that's the exception to the rule. I mean, look at, look at Piros, look at Klokov, look at, uh, Ilya, look at, you know, all these people that are, that perform at the highest level. And in general, uh, you'll see that they carry more lean body mass than their counterpart. And then further, I would argue that weightlifting has a significantly greater genetic component than sports like powerlifting or body bodybuilding and, and, and things of that nature. And to the extent that they have better genetics than you, what is the only thing that you can do to hope to compete with them <laughs> is, to mod- is to modify the things that you can modify. So, so basically the point being that as the more trained you get, i.e., post novice, which we've, which we've talked about before. If you want to increase your long-term strength potential, you have to increase your skeletal muscle mass. And if you want to optimize, if you want to claim that what you are doing is optimal for long-term strength progression, you should increase the amount of skeletal muscle mass that you have as much as possible, as soon as possible. So we have to look at what are the training determinants of muscular hypertrophy? How should we train in a way to increase the thing which will which will provide us with the long with the greatest long-term strength potential? And I think that we have massive amounts of evidence at this point, unequivocal, showing that training volume is the largest driver of muscular hypertrophy. There is additionally, and more significantly, a dose response, meaning the more sets you do at, uh, you know, to, to sufficient uh, levels of effort, the more hypertrophy you are going to get a dose response. Of course, we're not saying that there is not a diminishing return the more sets you do. Of course, everybody recognizes that. This is what we've talked about with training sensitivity and all sorts of stuff uh, in the past. So if you wanted to select the dose of training volume that gave you the best return on your amount of time, that's one option that you could pursue. And you could say, this is getting me the best bang for my buck in terms of uh, amount of time spent training. But you don't go and beat somebody in a competition by saying, well, I was more efficient with my training time. You go by being stronger than the person, which requires you to get more muscle mass and be you know, stronger than them in absolute terms. Yeah, I think a few things I'd want to say on the hypertrophy. So, so in addition, in addition to volume being the clear and overwhelming sort of driver of hypertrophy uh, response, hypertrophy response also seems to be independent of intensity, meaning that the weight of the movement doesn't matter, provided you're willing to do enough volume. And but once you've gotten to an intensity range of like sixty percent. Their intensity makes no difference, meaning that if you're above 60% of your one rep max and you're doing this thing for reps from a hypertrophy standpoint, there is no improvement if you move it to 70% or 80% or 90%. The idea with what we're trying to do, and so, and so this is kind of an important kind of mechanistic, mechanistic understanding that people should have, is that when we are training in order to deliver this stress to our tissues to induce hypertrophy, we are trying to perform sets at uh, with with a certain number of reps, depending on the uh, the level of intensity, that we are required to recruit all or as many of our uh, available motor units as possible and induce some fatigue upon them. So basically, once you get over a certain level of intensity, somewhere probably in the I don't I don't think we can very 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 confidently say it's like hard smack dab at sixty percent, but it's probably you know it's it's somewhere in say in the sixty to seventy percent range. Once you start getting over that, within a few reps of starting a set, you are recruiting all your motor units, um, and and uh, of course you could make the argument that hey why don't we just start out and just put 85% on the bar. That of course requires you to recruit all your motor units in the first rep. But what is the consequence of that? Is that it's more fatiguing and it limits how many sets you can do. And as we said, the number of sets is what gives us the dose response. So you have to find a balance of the intensity where you can perform enough sets to get the hypertrophic response that you're looking for in dose response fashion without inducing so much fatigue that you can't come back a day or two later and train again. Yeah. So if you, and and by the same token, if you do so many sets at say 60%, right? Hey, do 10 sets of 10 at 60%. The problem is you've made somebody, you've beat them up so much, you've made them so sore potentially that 
their body is unable to mount the sufficient hypertrophy response. That's what we were discussing like at the beginning of this podcast, that if you make somebody so sore and you, you overwhelm their ability to tolerate the training that you just gave them, they actually will have a diminished hypertrophy response. So I view this as actually kind of like a bell curve in, 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 in a way. So it sounds to me, it sounds to me like you're suggesting that our solution to all training problems is not in fact to increase the amount of stress and volume that people are doing. Not, no, maybe you, maybe you would change it. Maybe you would change. Ah, ah, there's some nuance there. <laughs> uh, but I do think from a hypertrophy standpoint, th- these things need to be abundantly clear that because you can do more volume at a relatively lower intensity. And by low, we mean like, I mean, we, and in general, I know that I don't tend to program very much below 70% for the vast majority of people. I might go to 68, but below that, unless I'm doing rehab or I'm trying to increase the work capacity of somebody who cannot tolerate anything higher, I don't go any lower than 70% for most people. Yeah. Yeah. I think very rarely have I gone below that or significantly below at all. And, and so, but, but that being said, set the difference between hypertrophy outcomes at 70 to 75% are uh, f- effectively nil unless the 75% fatigues you more and you can't train f- more free- as much. Yes. Which ultimately, so then higher intensity would be worse. And now if you bump it up to 85%, that significantly compromises the volume. So that's a worse outcome. And it's significantly more fatiguing if you try to do the same volume. So uh, the point would be that doing lower volume, period, okay, pro- it, 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 given two situations where you're not providing too much fatigue to somebody to tolerate, okay, doing lower volume, period, is worse for hypertrophy. 15 reps is worse than 25 reps, provided the person can tolerate both, right? Just doing it at a heavier weight doesn't mean, oh, well, we just made up for all that lost volume. Nope, you didn't. That might be better from this to develop the neuromuscular system, the ability, the neuromuscular adaptations to drive some of that, that strength improvement. But from a hypertrophy standpoint, it's not. In fact, there was a person today on a deleted thread who made, <laughs> made the statement that more higher intensity drives more hypertrophy, which is patently false, patently verifiably false. Okay. I want to make sure that's crystal clear that adding weight to the bar does not produce more hypertrophy. Yeah. Right. In a, particularly in a volume matched scenario. Correct. Correct. So going from, go, going from 200 pounds for three sets of five to 205 for three sets of five, the hypertrophy response is the same. Uh, you might even make the argument that the hypertrophy response is a little less from the person who previously could squat 200 for three sets of five, then moves up to 205 for three sets of five, because the signaling from that second workout by which they've already been exposed to the signaling is less. The other, yeah, a few other, a few other things to point out on this is that, you know, the counter argument would be, or that, that we've heard is that as the weights get heavier, you are shifting the type of hypertrophy that you're generating from a sarcoplasmic type, meaning you're producing more metabolic, uh, proteins, mitochondrial proteins, uh, other things like that to a more myofibrillar, myofibrillar uh, type of hypertrophy, which also, I mean, we can dispose of that idea. It's false uh, entirely. No evidence to support that. There's myofibrillar hypertrophy that can be measured at equal amounts, again, provided volume is sufficient, all the way down to around 30 or 40 percent 1RM if you're willing to do in, if you're willing to do insane sets of fucking 50 plus reps or something like that. But again, we don't program those. Uh, but you, you know, you can get myofibrillar hypertrophy across the entire spectrum. It's uh, intensity independent. Right. That's why blood flow restriction tends to work uh, in that one of the ways, one of the reasons why blood flow restriction works. So again, just, just to really, really wrap this up in a neat little bow, myofibrillar hypertrophy re- describes hypertrophy or enlargement of the contractile muscle proteins in the muscle. So this is myosin, actin, titan, and other proteins that actually contract. Okay. Whereas Sarcoplasmic hypertrophy is the enlargement of non-contractile proteins. So yes, mitochondria, the T-tubule system, you know, all these other little things that don't actually provide contractile force. They occur at the same time. They are intensity independent. So the main factors for driving muscular hypertrophy is going to be volume within the context of something that is not too fatiguing to where it compromises future training. So we're looking for the right dose of stress. And we can get away with lower volume to drive that from a purely hypertrophy. I mean, lower, lower intensity to drive that, I think. Sure. Yes. Yeah. So I think the conclusion of this little segment is that if we are looking to maximize someone's long-term strength potential, right, we want to give them the greatest shot at being the strongest they can be in the long term. We need to get them more jacked. And the sooner we can do that, the better. Conversely, the longer we wait to do that, 
by training them at the lowest possible amount of training that we can that we can give them and have any detectable effect the more time we're wasting in the long run because you know we're wasting we're we're, we're spending all this time basically if we're doing it at real heavy weights we're optimizing the neuromuscular function of the muscle mass they already have while having relatively minimal to no effect on cr building the muscle mass that will increase their long-term strength potential but the problem is that after, so for example, we, we talk about the novice program all the time, after a very low volume novice program, which the novice program is a low volume program, uh, the consequence of that is that your work capacity and recovery capacity, while it may be improved relative to you in the untrained state, is still the limiting factor in how much training you can tolerate. So if our goal is to maximize your strength potential, we know we have to get you jacked. And the sooner we do that, the better. If we need to do more volume to get you more jacked, but you can't tolerate that amount of training volume, then our job as a coach or your job as the trainee is to find a way to get yourself to be able to tolerate enough training to be able to maximize that variable. Because again, it is the strongest predictor of how you are able to generate force in the long run once you are the more post novice you are. So we have talked at length in our previous podcast about ways to increase work capacity, ways to increase recovery rates. You train more and you do conditioning, which this is why we program this stuff. Yeah, I mean, I think there's there's this general, I mean, it, the tides are turning, but there's general resistance to do like conditioning because it compromises your ability to perform the following day if it's new and novel and stressful enough. And that's certainly true. But again, we're setting you up for long-term development. We're, we're trying to see the forest for the trees rather than focus on day-to-day -day performance, unless the day-to-day -day performance is more important than long-term development. Reasons why your day-to-day -day performance may be more important. If you're going to a meet, if you're going to a competition where you're going to get paid, if there's a pretty girl in the gym, I, you know, look, there are the reasons why you would want to perform at the high, at your highest level uh, on particular days, but you're making compromises in your long-term development in order to demonstrate that performance. That's not training. That's the, that's performance. Okay. So we'll, we'll save that, that lecture for another day but uh, I think we've we've sufficiently hammered home hypertrophy as its contribution to uh, strength strength development over the long term the the second well the fourth variable that you listed which is also kind of the second thing at play is this neurological development right and and I think people may be under the wrong impression that we're just saying you know what do more volume get more jack train like a bodybuilder and uh, that's it you know that's all you need to do in order to be able to demonstrate you know, a high level of performance, a proficiency at a 5RM or 3RM or 1RM and a meet. And we are not doing that. And our programming does not reflect that. Rather, we are exposing people to tolerable amounts of high intensity training. Okay. High intensity, we would define as, you know, things above 75% uh, or 70%. I mean, there's no, again, no, there's no hard line like, oh, this is high intensity. In the literature, you'll find people try to define high intensity as anything above like 50% or even 60% I've seen. Um, but for us, we're thinking above 70%. And, uh, and even, even above 85%, we would both probably agree is actually like, that's high intensity, which is why when, when you, yeah, well, when you see us do like, or prescribe like, oh, do a single at RPE eight, you're, we're looking at a range between like 87 and 92%. And that single is not only practice at being able to perform singles. Okay. But it's an exposure to high intensity, very high intensity training at a dose that's tolerable doing repeat sets of three at 87% is very, very fatiguing. And that fatigue may not generate a great strength response because you can't do enough volume to grow muscle, you know, for most, for most folks. All right. And because it's going to compromise your future training for that week. Okay. By being very fatiguing, it's not, it's not going to be terribly, terribly effective at improving your strength. So we have to do, get more exposure to, uh, uh, the, the correct intensity. So most of our, our training probably revolves in that 70 to 83 percent range 70 to 80 percent range for volume with exposures to this ultra high intensity the singles uh that that we, we sometimes do when, when appropriate um and that's to really maximize the improvement uh uh in the neurological sort of adaptation you know to the extent that we can improve that for for lifters which is greater in the novice population and post novice it's diminishing but to deg the degree that we can uh, continue to develop that, that that's why we are prescribing repeats up to five at 75%, uh, triples at 80% uh, and stuff like that. It's because we are trying to keep that neurological adaptation improving. Um, and as far as that, you know, applies to going to a powerlifting meet or strength lifting meet and performing a heavy single, guess what you have to do to get really good at that? You have to do singles. 
because the single yes at 92% will say of a one or a one rep max is fatiguing, but it is not as fatiguing as doing a five rep max. Okay. It's not as fatigued because it, yeah. So, so you can tolerate doing regular singles at eight, like doing them four five, six. I mean, I, right now in my programming, I'm doing them 12 times a week, but it's just a single. That's only 12 reps. That's not, you know, it's not a huge deal. And I've worked myself up to that point over time. Um, and then the bread and butter of the volume training is going to be in that 70 to 80% range to, to sort of complement that. Yeah. I don't, I don't think I have a whole lot to add to that. I think, I think it's important that we be, be very, very clear when we say that in order to express the levels of strength or force production that we are trying to build, uh, you know, we, we build the foundation by, with the, with the muscular hypertrophy, which increases your strength potential, but it in and of itself doesn't probably do a, a ton to increase your absolute strength compared to actually handling heavy weights. So we are in no way shying away from heavy weights. And I think anyone who really pays attention to our training or sees what we do in our own training probably recognizes that we, that we lift relatively heavy weights. It's just that the super heavy stuff that's above the 85% range, for example, uh, uh, is, 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 uh, is comprised of a relative a pretty significant minority of the total training that we do yep yep and so and ultimately we're just trying to manage fatigue you know we know that we need to regularly handle uh higher intensity weights and so we're doing that in a way that allows us to accrue significant volume without compromising the training going you know later on that week or the next week whereas doing maximal sets all the time or circa maximal sets all the time would sufficiently compromise our future training so that's how we're managing fatigue um, which leads into kind of this this other variable that we we play around with a lot and we get a lot of heat for is exercise variation people are like why why so many exercise variants bro and uh, really we're just trolling you you know no uh <laughs> I mean, I, I would go. I would go on record in saying that I don't think that there is a enough data at this point to mandate exercise variations for improved outcomes with regards to strength performance. That being said, I think there are theoretical models that, at present, offer very compelling sort of evidence for inclusion of exercise variations. And and I'll just kind of run through the list uh, with the with the disclaimer that I I would freely admit that this is a squishy part of programming right now. So it, because exercise variations, the ones that we use are fairly similar to the competition list. So the squat, the deadlift, the press, the bench press. Okay. They're fairly similar to them. There is an element of the repeated bout effect that uh, uh, is carried over to them, meaning that you don't get like brutally sore from doing a an RDL or a stiff legged deadlift because you've already been deadlifting. Okay. Uh, that being said, it is kind of novel to that person. And so the idea is that degree of, of newness or, or being different allows them to use less volume in order to generate the same amount of stress. All right. So that's, that's thing one, potentially volume sparing because it is a uh, slightly newer or un, uh, a novel uh, exercise. Um, second, because it's lighter, okay, you can uh, uh, manage fatigue that way instead of just doing more deadlifts. Uh, another element to that is if you did more deadlifts, guess what? <laughs> you get less sensitive to the deadlifts due to a number of things. This attenuated signaling due to repeated bout effect. All right, that's these are uh, plausible sort of mechanisms that we've seen that with some support in the evidence. There's psychological stuff. Ooh. There's psychological stuff here as well, like people enjoying their training. Um, you know, they're like, hey, I've been doing swap bench deadlift press only for the last, you know, three or four months. Isn't there something else I can do? Or they get excited about doing a variation or, or you know, Austin, you know, this would be a, a good example of for, for me and for you. We know the numbers that we're supposed to handle on a squat bench deadlift press that like represent good performances. And so if all we did were those lifts, then we have these expectations of, okay, well, so for a triple today on a squat, I need to hit 550. Otherwise I'm, <laughs> you know, I'm a, I'm a failure. And so there's some psychological, like, uh, uh, you know, I have to all day you're thinking about it. Whereas a two count pause squat, even though you do have, you know, we've been doing them for a while. So we do have this sort of historical knowledge. It's not to the same level of like psychological stress. Like I have to hit this. Otherwise, you know, it's a, it's a bad training session. So I think that's probably an underrated thing. I think the criticism is going to be that you're just like 
you know, escaping, sacking up and doing what you need to do in training, which fine, that's, that's, that's one side of the argument. But I think that suffering in training is not a, uh, is not something that we should be pursuing. I think that we should all be right for long. We should be enjoying our training. I mean, I think back over the course of all of my years of, of, of doing barbell training or even further beyond that training in other sports. And, uh, you know, I, I, like when I swam, I trained with a lot of teammates who were, who were burned out in the pool. Um, and I can say that throughout my entire swimming career, I was never burned out even once. Um, cause I enjoyed what I was doing when, in terms of barbell training, you know, I've been training for the, for, for many years at this point. Uh, I can say that I was probably burned out at only one point in my training career. And it was right before my last session uh, of uh, intensity day on Texas method when, when I was, when I was feeling pretty smoked all around. Other than that, I've never been burned out in training. So I think that's a hugely underrated thing because it promotes adherence, consistency, showing up, doing the thing. Yep. Uh, a couple other factors, uh, one has to do with like motor learning. So we, we discussed that, you know, early specialization in sports, probably not a great idea. Uh, you know, you don't want to just do one thing. You want a wide berth, a wide exposure to different physical tasks so that you generate a general improvement in your ability to perform motor tasks. Uh, and so exposing yourself to different uh, variations, different movement patterns likely increases the sort of base of physical development. And that's kind of what we see in people who play a lot of sports growing up and then end up specializing later on. And we think that that probably carries over well into barbell training as this is sort of a general sort of physical uh, task that you have to do. Uh, the last thing I will say is there's some evidence that people, given their different anthropometry, genetics, um, and, 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 you know, and when I talk about anthropometry, I'm also referring to, as Dr. Baraki said, like muscle insertions and, and, and stuff like that that when they do different variations, they get a different hypertrophy response than, uh, than other folks. And that may be very, very useful in um, improving muscle hypertrophy. And this has been verified by MRI studies where people will do like a close grip bench press. And, you know, some people will get a, a much more robust uh, hypertrophy response in certain heads of the tricep and anterior deltoid, for instance, than others as verified by muscle cross-sectional area on an MRI. And so it's not a generalizable thing, but what we're doing exercise variation, when we include them, we're also looking at the empirical evidence that we're generating. Like how does this person respond to these exercise variations? And so each person, if you talk to somebody who's been competing in powerlifting, for instance, for 15 years, they know these are the exercise variations that that really seem to work uh, for me. And they, they have, not, and that's not only the belief system and like, hey, deficit deadlifts are my jam for bringing up my deadlift, but that's through you know experience. And, and I think one of the reasons we like exercise variations um, is to promote uh, that hypertrophy response uh, uh, in a little bit different manner. Uh, but again, disclaimer again at the end of this, this is the squishiest part of programming science if there is one. And so we are willing to retool our model on this would presented new evidence and we hope that more evidence starts to accrue on this point. All right. So before we, uh, before we wrap up, the last couple things we want to talk about is kind of the way, you know, we've talked about a whole bunch of different training variables, a whole bunch of different outcomes that we're pursuing when we, uh, when we are programming for people in order to achieve these outcomes. And so, you know, this stuff can be pretty overwhelming and obviously it's taken us, you know, a coaching career's worth of time so far to, uh, you know, develop some ideas and some, element of expertise on some of these things. But, uh, the question that we get a lot is like, how do they know, how do how should people know how to either evaluate their programs to see if they make sense in the context of this kind of stuff that we're talking about, or how, how should these variables be manipulated over time? And of course there's loads of different periodization models and different ideas and theories as to how variables should be manipulated over time to achieve a particular training outcome. And a common, uh, theme, at least in the context of some of the, the discussions that we've had, has to do with changing one versus changing multiple variables at a time. So I think we've laid out, at least so far, our model as to how we're going to develop people over the long term. And so when we zoom out and look, zoom way out and look over the long term development of somebody's career, manipulating more than one variable at once at a, at a kind of an acute time point in someone's training uh, be, seems to carry a little bit less significance than, than advertised. But still, I think it's worth talking about. Uh, in particular, uh, the manipulation of these training variables in the context of, again, complex biological systems with significant inter-individual variability. Uh, and so this is something we come back on, kind of harp upon repeatedly. So 
let's say that you have this kind of lifter that you're starting with and you're going to work with them over time. If you have no real, uh, you know, kind of compelling pre-existing evidence or knowledge of their training or their training response, and you don't know what they're going to respond well to or poorly to, and you want to go down variable by variable and make one tweak at a time and run it for, you know, a sufficient amount of time to collect enough data that would show you beyond just kind of random variation, uh, in the in the data that you're collecting, that you are generating a significant response in them that will have a kind of a what we'd call like a clinically significant impact on their training development. Uh, it would just take exceedingly long. Uh, the long and the and the more trained a person becomes, the longer that process would take uh, in terms of how long you would need to run things to determine whether a single variable change that you made worked or not. Uh, so there's a practicality issue from that standpoint, I think. Uh, and then additionally, if once you have determined whether your variable change did work or did not work after that amount of time, the problem is, is that you are no longer dealing with the same trainee or the same person that you were dealing with when you started out that variable change. In other words, let's say you made a variable change, you ran it for a few weeks uh, or a training block or a training cycle or whatever, and then at the end you say, oh, it didn't work. Well, the issue is that they've been training that whole time. They are a different person. And so all of a sudden you're with a new blank slate and you don't, you, you, you're kind of back to a point where you can't predict, uh, you know, their training response at that point to a given thing versus, versus another thing. So if, if, if the, if, if we were indeed kind of machines and not have this complex adaptive biology, then yeah, you could just go back to the drawing board and say, oh, that seemed to have absolutely no effect on the person. So I can start over from square one and do round two trial number two on this person. But that's really not how we work or how our physiology works in terms of the constant cycling of stress and recovery and adaptation that we've talked about. Almost every day you go in the gym, you are a somewhat different organism than you were a few days prior. So I think the I think the point that I'm trying to make is that again, the idea of kind of the logical analysis and simplifying things down in this kind of arguably reductionistic view is very, very, very it's it's attractive. I can understand the allure of it and and why you know it's it's the way that we want to look at things, uh, but. Unfortunately, it's just not how our physiology works and things are not as simple as we like to make them when it comes to this stuff. Yeah, unless everybody's got like a, a, a identical twin that they're just doing twin studies on, you know, A-B tests. It, it's not, you can't make one variable change at a time and then assess with any reliability anyway. So I don't see the reason of limiting yourself to that, particularly when if you have fundamental principles that you're trying to adhere to when designing a program. So just changing the volume may not be enough of a change that you'd want to do. You might also want to change exercise variations. You may want to change average intensity. I mean, these are all different variables and you can't just do one at a time anyway. So for instance, with the volume, you can't just pump the volume and keep the average intensity the same if the average intensity is too high to support that change. Right. So you automatically from there have to change more than one variable. Right. Right. So yeah, when people say one variable at a time, you just say, no, wrong, wrong. You just do that. Do, do your best Donald Trump impersonation. Okay. So, <laughs> wrong. Okay. So, so I think there's a good time to just sort of, I want to give like a, a another just line in the sand, how we do intermediate or uh, as we like to call it post novice training differently. So one, we see no benefit to running it out, peaking, decreasing uh, training volume at the end of a novice LP for more weight on the bar. We think that's a bad trade-off from a muscle hypertrophy standpoint, for a work capacity standpoint, from a long-term development standpoint. We think there's really no purpose of doing that unless unless somebody's going to a meet, right? In which case, there you might do a mini taper anyway. Or if that's the only way to keep them training and you have data that significantly improves compliance, although in our experience, which is fairly robust, uh, that has not been the case. Okay. Uh, thing two, we would on average reduce the average intensity of the trainee and increase the volume for each movement pattern, the squat movement pattern, a pressing movement pattern, which includes the press and the bench press and all variations in between and pulling. Uh, we would increase the total volume reps time sets and decrease the average intensity from the novice linear progression um, to post novice training. All right, and that would not look like the Texas method. Uh, that would not look like the standard four-day split uh, without serious modifications. But we are also, to be clear, not removing all higher intensity work from the training either. Correct. Yeah. And so again, if we're defining high, uh, higher intensity work at stuff above 70%, that's still high enough intensity to drive uh, strength adaptations. And if you were really 
uh, concerned with absolute strength performance, then we would make a case for including singles at a you know, or, or similar uh, relatively frequent exposures to those sort of things to develop that skill. Okay, and we would further argue that a failure to train like that to have regular exposure to the higher intensities in a non terribly fatiguing way would be mismanagement. So if you had a person who really wants to compete in powerlifting and you're not programming in regular singles, then you are compromising their performance at, at subsequent meets because that is an obvious need that they have and, and you're not addressing it. Uh, the next thing that we would do that is likely different than others is that we would include a wider variety of training exercises for all the reasons that I just discussed. We think that from a hypertrophy standpoint, that likely works better from a fatigue management standpoint, that likely works better from a technique improvement standpoint. We likely get more purchase out of using exercise variations than just hammering the, the standard, the standard lifts. Uh, and so those would be the main differences in an intermediate program. We still would likely keep a three or four day sort of training um, training program. We would likely do two or three lifts per day, but the overall training volume would go up week to uh, from a, a weekly standpoint. Um, so from the starting strike novice LP, we would increase total training volume from week to week. Uh, and we would try to figure out which exercise variations are the most applicable to that person. I think a lot of this can be summed up in the article, The Great Wide Open, which is available on our website, uh, barbellmedicine.com. I will link that in the show notes. Um, it's just as far as the variables at which we would change and, and how we would change them. But that is a significant difference than either peaking, running it out, or moving to something like the Texas Method proper. Um, so I think this brings us to a nice end point for a break. All right, so we're going to take a little break. After the break, we're going to come back and give you our take-home points. Thanks for joining us. All right, over on the barbellmedicine.com website or amazon.com, we are selling Perry RX. That is our Perry Workout Blend. We have two versions without caffeine, one version with caffeine for those who want to treat it as a pre-workout it's got everything you need from a peri workout supplementation standpoint to improve your performance, maximize your recovery, and hopefully you see a little benefit. We also sell a very high quality whey protein isolate, and that's also available on the amazon.com website or our website, barbellmedicine.com. All right, welcome back to the Barbell Medicine Podcast. This is episode number 24. We are nearing the end of the third part of our programming podcast. We're so happy that you're here with us, joined with Dr. Baraki, as always. So we've covered a lot of stuff, like uh, a lot of stuff. You know, maybe this should be a book. <clears throat> I want to, you know, summarize this nicely for all of our all of our listeners and viewers with some take home points. And I think we have a few. So I'll let you kick this guy off and then uh, I can jump in if there's some more nuance that I want to get into. So, uh, so uh, you know, going back to all the way to the first of these three podcasts up till now, we'll, we'll try to give a concise summary in a few points. So basically, the first point we're going to make is that all individuals fall along somewhere along a training uh, a spectrum of sensitivity to training stress. Some individuals responding more robustly than others uh, based on a variety of factors. More anabolically sensitive individuals will get a long, larger response from a given dose of training compared to their anabolically uh, or training resistant counterparts who therefore require a larger dose to generate the same physiologic response. Anything to add there? No, I, I mean, I think it's fairly novel also that just discussing this training sensitivity, training resistance spectrum, and that, you know, we're not using genders, we're not using uh, weight on the bar. It really, we're just go based, basing this on empirical sort of responses to given tra training variables. And that adequately encompasses the training experience for all individuals. And I think that if you want to counter that model or suggest that it is uh, untrue or unuseful, then you have to come up with a, a, a compelling model that also encompasses the training experience for all individuals. Um, and if you can't do that, then we're going to just assume that we're right. So, <laughs> um, yeah, I, I think, and you know, the second point that I, I think we'd like to make is that untrained, any untrained lifter, the, the simple novice linear progression is a great starting point. We think that the, it's elegantly designed for people who've never trained before. You get repeated exposure to complex motor tasks that ultimately set you up uh, uh, for a long training career if you follow that correctly. Uh, and, you know, basically it's, it's giving you this nice base of training to draw from in the future. It doesn't matter where you end 
the progression at weight wise. It doesn't matter, you know, uh, uh, how long it lasts. And on average, it's going to last between nine to 12 weeks. And we see no benefit to extending this artificially by removing sets, do, you know, do, uh, adding comp, uh, more complex variables within the framework of the program itself, because we feel like once you end, once you come to the end of the novice linear progression and that you can't add weight to the bar every single time, then you have generated evidence that you need a different programming. I mean, you need different programming. So there's no need to sort of just run it out. You don't get a, a gold star at the end. Nobody calls you and says, hey, you just won a prize. <laughs> you just, for, for your own training, you should likely, once once you've had that evidence, you got to move forward. Uh, anything, anything to add there? Yeah, no, I agree with that. Uh, I think the next, the next point we'll make is that the more trained someone becomes, i.e. the more, the further post novice someone is differences in their amount of skeletal muscle mass account for a larger and larger proportion of their strength performance. In other words, their force production potential. Um, and that has a consequence, um, in that, since training volume is the primary driver of muscular hypertrophy with a dose response effect seen, meaning more sets, more hypertrophy, that that is something that should be maximized sooner rather than later in order to optimize someone's long-term potential. Uh, additionally, there is no evidence that different training strategies in terms of loading result in differential uh, responses between sarcoplasmic versus myofibrillar hypertrophy, or that this should be a concern that guides programming decisions at all. Sure. Yeah. So I think uh, the the addition I would make to that is for an untrained person who started in starting strength novice linear progression that those workouts do generate a near maximal hypertrophy response until. It doesn't. And the evidence that you have that is not generating a good hypertrophy response, one of, one of the, the things that you'll see is you won't be able to add weight to the bar anymore because you're not improving the hyper, you're not improving the muscle cross-sectional area, which is an increasingly larger component of how much force you can produce. So once your novice progression has started to peter out, guess what that means? That your muscles are not growing and keeping the same uh, rate of improvement in force production. Uh, that you're demanding each workout, which means that you would need more volume, and more more uh, a training stress to drive that hypertrophy response. Yeah. So if we want the trainee to be able to tolerate the amount of training volume necessary to maximize their anabolic response and therefore set them up with the highest amount of skeletal muscle mass for long-term uh, strength potential, they have to have enough work capacity to be able to tolerate that amount of training. So if to the extent that they do not have that uh, a sufficient amount of work capacity, either when they start out training or at the end of their novice phase. Uh, the uh, one of the uh, primary goals of the training should be to get them to the point where they can tolerate enough training to uh, to do enough training to optimize their long term strength potential again by doing enough training volume. So this means that we tend to increase our training volumes at useful, recoverable intensities. Again, for us, the lower bound of where we tend to program tends to fall right around 70%. Um, and tends to not go much higher than the low than 80 to the maybe the low 80s uh, percent on people. Uh, and in addition to this, uh, the neuromuscular side of uh, force production, in, uh, in other words, developing the skills and the neuromuscular capacity to recruit your motor units that you have now built uh, in a way that will allow you to pr uh, produce the most force requires you to regularly handle heavy loads. However, we want to program your exposure to heavy loads in a way that they are not so fatiguing that they uh, represent a, that they detract from the rest of your training in a given week. So we do that very deliberately, as we've discussed earlier in the podcast. Yeah, and and the next point kind of relates to this is we use these exercise variation as a tool to manage that fatigue, to manage the stress, to manage the total volume. Uh, and, and there are other benefits to exercise variables as well as we discussed the potential technique, potential greater hypertrophy response or differential hypertrophy response, um, all sorts of things. But ultimately, fatigue management is probably the, one of the more compelling sort of uh, arguments there. And I, I think if you take away from our programming podcast that we want to apply the correct amount of stress for the desired outcomes, like that's probably, <laughs> you know, our, our programming sort of philosophy uh, in, in, in not so many words. Yeah. And those outcomes that we're talking about are how strong are you going to be five to 10 years from now or something like that? Not how much are you going to lift tomorrow? Right. Because that ultimately that doesn't matter unless the meat is tomorrow. But if the meat is tomorrow, it's already too late to make a change. I mean, so, so there you go. You know, and, and I, uh, 
it is probably less attractive and ultimately costs us business because we are unable to say it's very simply, very definitively, very confidently, this is the way, just do this. Because humans are complex. We are a diverse biological organism with multiple different inputs, multiple variables that we are, some of which we're not even aware of at this point, despite scientific advancements. And so we aren't just machines where you just add five pounds and generate that response. Or And so to kind of expect that to be the you know the the only variable that's useful i think is is overly reductionistic and and yeah we're, it's squishy programming is squishy i you know i don't know of a better way to 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 get that point across but we are complex programming is complex to expect it to be simple or to make it simple is likely missing a lot of important information or a lot of important considerations that need to be made uh, in real time uh, by somebody with a lot of experience and luckily between the two of us, we have uh, we've done a little bit of a little bit, you know. Hey, we we sent some people to IPF Worlds. Yeah, it turns out we sent some people to IPF Worlds. We've competed at high levels. We've somehow managed to escape the depths of mediocrity, despite our our non impressive our non impressive lifts early on. And so I think that uh, as far as experience is concerned, I think that you and I have that. And to suggest otherwise would just be ignoring the uh, the facts. So. I think I don't want to talk about programming for like ever again. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. It it is interesting, but like I could go for a break. Yeah. So uh, we need to come up with some more interesting topics to talk about again sometime soon. Do you want to do like global warming or? (laughs) 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 No, no. We'll come up with something. We're going to come up with a new series. It's uh, that's going to be interesting. Uh, Probably not pertaining to programming. We hope you guys enjoyed it. Uh, We, as always, appreciate you guys getting on iTunes, leave us some positive reviews for the one person out of the next 10. who's going to leave us a bad review. Hey man, hope your day gets better. But, uh, as always, you can check us out over at barbellmedicine.com. You can find podcasts, iTunes, Google Play. We're on there. We'll be on Spotify soon. Uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel for all the latest content. For Dr. Austin Baraki, I am Dr. Jordan Feigenbaum. Thanks for joining us on the Barbell Medicine Podcast. We'll see you guys next time. Oh, 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 oh.